talked about at the beginning of the meeting, um, basically your mission, how it had evolved from initially just helping people get their AMPs, which is really not a just, it's, it's a pretty big deal for all of us coming out of the military. So you yeah. realize there was still uh, a missing link between us getting jobs after we had our AMP, you know, and, and getting somewhere to, to see our value as right. military um, for me, I had been in for six and a half years in the Navy as an engine mechanic, and because engines are so niche, that type of work isn't in as high demand as you would think. So what ended up happening is people that had a lot of structures experience or a structures background, because so much more of the work is categorized under an A, the airframe portion, mm -hmm. people like me were kind of turned away a lot. And still, it, it was still hard, don't get me wrong, for any of us to kind of get a job, translate that experience. But, you know, after I got out, it took me about two years to get my AMP because I wanted to take a different route, only to find out that I missed working on airplanes. And so uh, when I finally made the decision to jump back on and, and get my AMP, I did it. And as I was doing that, I started building my LinkedIn profile, um, working on my resume, there's a lot of military jargon that civilians don't understand. And we hear that a lot when we watch videos or read posts or whatever it may be. We're even talking right. to hiring managers. They want you to explain and we get frustrated because they don't understand. But most people haven't been in the military. They don't know. And right. so that was kind of my journey, figuring out what works and what doesn't. And then taking advice from people like Michael Quinn and, and others who regularly post about this type of stuff and so I kind of came up with my own little my little acronym and my steps that I used and it's the DSSL which is you know you define yourself you have to know yourself what you want what you don't want what does um, DSSL mean so it's define uh sharpen support and then landing and the landing at the end is the tailoring the resume and and having references for the job but the in between the really the most important part is the D, the, de the define once you get out there's nobody helping us holding our hand to get there and there's so much information it's really really overwhelming and so for me i had to figure out okay what does lorraine want well i got out of the military because i wanted to be home more so taking a job that required a lot of travel or a contracting job that I would be three months here and you know six months there, and, you know overseas was a no go for me. I mean, you, we want to make money, but we're just not going to make the same money. And not when you say being home, you meant by being local. Yeah, staying local, being around my parents, my sisters. Um, that was really important to me because I'd missed out on all that while I was gone, yeah. and so. The other thing is I wanted to find a place where I wouldn't be pigeonholed again as an engine mechanic right. and get a lot of that structures experience I never got. So the other part of that, the D, the define was finding a place that would allow me to, that was small enough that would let me work on all types of things, not right. just, you know, engines. They'd say, oh, you're good at right. engines, you'll be engine drop today. Oh, you want to learn how to do rivets today? Okay, let's do that. Oh, well, these guys are troubleshooting, um, some avionics issues, why don't you go over there with them? That's really part of it that I wanted. The caveat to that is places that aren't compartmentalized don't pay as much. So I had to sacrifice money in order to get some experience. And right. part of that defined too is doing your area research and knowing what the area pays. So if you want to make $37 an hour, but the top out for somebody that has technically no experience as a AMP, a licensed AMP, not on military aircraft, isn't that high. For Orlando, right now, market says $23 an hour, but if you look at any job, they usually start out at 16, which kind of sucks. It's the reality, yeah. but it's the truth. And you want to figure out, well, do I want to work on big planes or small planes or rockets? That's going to change your price. And so you have to be realistic. And once yeah. you kind of do your market research, you and you figure out, you know, what you want, whether you want to be home or travel, you know, if you want benefits, what shift you want to work, right? If you apply to the airline because they're unionized, 
you're probably going to get stuck on nights for like 10 years. Yeah. It's just how it is. It's seniority right. based. And so those are things that we don't get told and that we don't know. So right. asking those questions and doing that research is going to be so critical to like avoiding the heartbreak. And yeah. so I try, to, I try to tell as many people as I can, just be realistic. What do you really want? Yeah. But I mean, it paid off, you know, I went from making $20 an hour to making $26 an hour and then who knows what's next. But I know for right. my very first job working at the warehouse, as soon as I got out, not knowing what I wanted to do, I was making $12 an hour. So, yeah. you know, from being an E5 to making $12 an hour, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's a huge reality check to say the least. Um, right. And so once I figured out what I wanted and I started sharpening, you know, with what direction I wanted to go doing my market research, I looked for that support. I didn't have mentors like we did in the military. I, you, you literally get assigned one. And so I didn't have that. So I had to go out and just shoot in the dark, kind of asking right. people after I did some research on their profiles and, and hmm. looked at their experience and reached out to them with a nice note to connect and said, hey, you know, I'm Lorraine and I'm a new AMP and I saw all of your experience and I was impressed because, you know, usually somebody that has done that much knows a lot. You know, would you want to connect with me and potentially be a mentor? And a lot of times I would get positive feedback from these people, you know, and I still talk to some of them. Um, and then of course, once you get you know, mentors and support. One of them I also use is Veterati. So you go to Veterati, it's, it's good for active duty, for veterans, for mill spouses, it's free. And wow. so I use that plenty of times to kind of help shape what I want to do within my job and then my other aspirations in my life. And kind of took all those little things and tailored my resume and then asked some of those people as references for jobs, you know, or if they right. knew somebody to introduce me and it, it's helped out, you know, I'm, I'm doing much better now, but it didn't have to be so painful. Mm, right. So, and I know that's part of your mission too, is trying to make the transition right. process as easy as possible. Right. Yeah. That's the, uh, the mission of code one since day one of, um, it's, it's broke some relationships, broke, uh, some business relationships, especially, uh, I was supposed to build a school with somebody and he wasn't as invested. Uh, he, a little business this guy had, it was what I, I found out later. It, it is a, a lifestyle business. Lifestyle business is where they take basically the profits, uh, pay the bills and they, uh, take home the money basically. So what I wanted to do was invest back into it, put money into it, bro build the program, build the, uh, uh, the services as much as possible. And the whole mission is to ensure that all the service members getting out of the military is, I can min help them minimize their, their transition. Yeah. Uh, because in my experience, um, there was not a lot of information about AMP that nobody know, and it's still kind of the same way. Some people don't even know what an AMP is and how valuable it can be. If, for your example, you wanted to stay local, uh, here, there's an airport right across the street, you know, instead of going all over overseas and going on these trips and stuff like that, people can work in town and still get a decent job after the military. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I've talked to several of my friends. They have like two masters, two bachelors, you got AMP, all these certificates. And to me, it, it kind of raised a red, a red flag. And it's like, dude, why are you doing all this stuff? And it's cool that you're doing all this, but you know, you can't, you can't, you're going way overboard. And he's like, and so I'm just scared. I'm just scared to transition. And it, that's where the light bulb popped. And it's like, Oh, you know, I got to do this, not just help them get the certificate. It's the whole process throughout until they separate until 
even after the DD214. So that's why I um, started up military uh, maintainers transition program to help them, something small as getting them a suit and tie, uh, getting them the tools that they'll need when they go into civilian life because a lot of places, I'm sure, a lot of places are not going to provide the tools. They're going to have to buy their own. And then that's yep. their responsibility. So that's the oh, mission yeah. of Code 1 is to help that process. And more and more every day, I'm learning something new about uh, you know resources that are out there. And it's just, it doesn't get grow enough awareness when the guys are on a boat or on the flight line or uh, they're out in the middle of Alabama working on helicopters and stuff like that. They just don't hear that kind of uh, stuff. And they're working outside. They're not inside at a government computer. And they can see all the advertisement, all the resources. And I know for sure in the Air Force, as much as people think that we get a lot of money, uh, the computers still suck. And we never like to be on the computer at all So, but because we're outside. We're out in the environment where if it's hot, cold, whatever it is, we're out there, we're working, and nobody's really reaching out to them. Nobody's going up to them while they're working. Like, hey, you know, this is basically a solicit or however they want to see it, but nobody's reaching them. Nobody's, uh, I know a lot of times when you're waiting for an aircraft to come in, you're on your phone. I don't know, I don't know how it's in the military or uh, in the Navy. I don't yeah. know what kind of service to have, but uh, when we're here, at, like for example, Davis Mountain, we're waiting for an aircraft. You know, we're on our phone waiting, just you know, letting time pass until it comes back. And and nobody was doing that. Nobody was on social media. I was like, you know, the average age is around mid twenties, younger twenties. Mm -hmm. And what what do they all do? How they connect with everybody else? Social media. And nobody was on it. So I took advantage of that little piece to push out the content, educate them. It was like, hey, get this. You'll have a better uh, post-military career if you stay in the aviation, if you want to stay in the aviation. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the mission of Code 1, is trying to grow this awareness of any resources or opportunities and, and uh, uh, for these uh, aviation technicians. Oh yeah. I mean, it's having those qualifications. I mean, when I started studying for my FCCs and I got my first one, people were just asking, what's the point of you doing that? They're not going to pay me more, you know, yeah. at my first aviation job. And I said, you know, if it's not them, it's somebody else. And you could see the light bulb that went off. Yeah. Like, well, you know, why should you hold yourself back? if the current situation you're in is not helping you grow. Mm. And so that's one of the big things I like to talk about too is, you know, you want to define your short and long-term career goals as much as you do your personal goals. Exactly. But we are exactly like air. We're fluid. And what does air do? It fills up the room that it's in. It completely occupies it. But if you never change rooms, you're never going to get any bigger. Right. And so, that's probably one of my favorite analogies to use is be fluid like air and change your room when you need to, when, when you've grown into it. Right. Right. And, and plus the, the military pays for it. So why not add that little element to your resume? So, you know, that yeah. way when you do become, from what I understand, the civilian uh, workforce, it's not like the military where you're, just specific to this job and you can't really wander anywhere else. Over there, you can ask this specialist, the radio specialist, for example, and mm -hmm. ask them, hey, teach me how to work on this. Oh, and yeah. If, and you can grow into something like the grow or the SEC stuff or uh, improve sheet your metal. sheet metal stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or if you want to specialize on certain things, you can and you can get certificates for, for those specialties as well. Mm -hmm. And FA is so huge and there's, I'm sure there's, there's a, 
you know, you need a certificate for this, you need a certificate for that, you need a license for this, and you need a license for that. Another thing, yeah, another thing that um, has happened recently is Space Tech is a company that works specifically for the aerospace industries, right? Aerospace mm -hmm. and aviation are twins, fraternal, not identical. And they actually have created their own um, licensures for uh, vehicle processing, composite. So you can actually look at the Space Tech website. The mm -hmm. aviation world doesn't have anything for structure specifically besides experience that I've seen. Right. Yeah. But that's and something to consider, you know. And for anyone like me, I didn't get my AMP till I got out, you know. So I had to pay for it, three thousand dollars, at the end of the day, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, if you're working for a, a company, they usually have tuition assistance. So if you work for an aviation type company, you can, if they have tuition assistance, that's something similar to, to the cool programs, right? Mm -hmm. Where the Air Force right. made cool, where you can use that. Usually what happens is the same thing you, from my understanding, because I never got to use cool, <laughs> yeah. is you pay for it and then you get reimbursed. Mm. Um, it, it depends who it is. I know the army, they reimburse them. Uh, I know they're changing up their program where, uh, they paid it up front, but, nice. uh, for the, for the air force, it's, they, the role is that they have to give you the money before you attend a class. So it's, they'll oh. give it to you up front. Well, actually they'll pay the vendor and then they can go, uh, uh attend the class. Okay. And I haven't really worked with the Navy. Uh, from what I understand, it's the same way as the Air Force, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not positive on it. I haven't uh, taken that. I haven't uh, worked with any Navy people. I mean, we're in Arizona, so I don't imagine I'm dealing with a lot of... Too many boats over there. <laughs> um, the other thing, too, was the GI Bill. It does cover um, your testing. So if it's not an approved course already, you can call them up and, and bug them about it, you know. But for some of my testing, I actually, I had paid for it and then I put in my reimbursement. Um, yeah. And they gave it to you. The caveat to that is if your test is, let's say, only $200, you're using an entire month's worth of GI Bill. Mm. So that's something to consider if, if, and you don't get any of the housing allowance for it either. So if that's something that's um, important to you, might want to take that out of your own pocket rather than put in for the expenses. Right, right. Yeah, Something I learned. Yeah, prep course, prep courses are not approved, but as far as the license or the uh, exams itself, mm -hmm. uh, your DME, your your mm -hmm. your uh, knowledge exams, they are reimbursable. Yes. And uh, I tell all those, I tell everybody. Even if they fail a thousand times, I was like, take this, here's the address, here's the form, send it in, they'll reimburse you. So, yep. that, yeah, that's a great thing. But as far as like prepping you and schools, books, and all that stuff, no, they won't reimburse okay. that. Not that I, I haven't. I tried, I, I've been told, I tried that too. <laughs> I tried oh, that okay. too. They said no. They said yeah, no. And I, yeah, I was told no as well. But for one, I understand if I wanted to accept the GI Bill. I do, I had to have credentials, a credit, you know, accreditation, then uh, something like what you mentioned, the uh, space tech uh, people, we work with them with the aircraft electronics technician cert. And there's, is, there is a sheet metal cert mm -hmm. and I'm trying to work with them, but I need to have a certified uh, shop and I need to have a certified teacher. And then once I get that, I can be accredited under their their umbrella, whatever that may be. So that's something we're working on. And uh, we actually spoke to uh, this one young guy. He, I'm not sure if he won the uh, sheet metal competition or he came in second place. Either he came one or two, but he lives here in Tucson and he uh, did really well in that competition. And I, we, we started talking about you know, possibly having sheet metal classes here in my shop. So, and then that way we could provide uh, certificates for sheet metal as well. I think it, I think it'd be super, 
uh, useful for new guys wanting to get into aviation or somebody, you know, going from the military, being a doctor or something like that, and we could want to work on aviation. So I think it's a good, you know, a good step for that. And it's very Perfect. short. I think, I think um, their requirements is like 300 hours. Something like really? that. Yeah, it's not a lot of hours. Well, it's a few months, but it's not bad. It's a lot shorter than a uh, part 147 school, that's for sure. Yeah. Not bad. But, not bad at all. So during normal environment in the aviation world, how was how was uh the aviation environment before the uh the virus deal? Um honestly I we haven't been shut down because where I'm at it's um okay. have government contracts, so that kind of makes us essential employees. But awesome. what what I've been hearing um, from some of the people just local in the area, they were pretty nervous about having to shut down. And I think, well, I know for a fact, it depends on what, what kind of contracts they have. So if they don't have any military contracts, as far as I know, they're not working, right. you know? Um, but prior to all that, it's, Unlike military aviation, a lot of the data is not centralized. So that's the one thing that drives me absolutely insane is yeah. that, you know, you'll look at a manual and it'll say remove pump, but it's buried somewhere around a bunch of other stuff it doesn't tell you to remove in the manual. And yeah. then you have to look at your 4313s for extra data if you need it, if the manufacturer doesn't specify. Um, your FARs, you really should know your FARs so that you know what's legal and what isn't, what you're allowed to sign off mm -hmm. and what you can not. Mm -hmm. um, and just staying up to date on all that. It's, it's can get a little overwhelming when you are so new and you're not used to it. But once you yeah. start practicing, it's not too bad. Um, that's, right. that'd be my, my biggest thing probably to pass on is that because data is not centralized, if you do not know, don't guess, ask. And if right. the person, asking doesn't know keep poking the bear until somebody gives you a legitimate answer and yeah. reading uh, is fun. <laughs> yeah for sure um getting a laptop or a tablet with all that information already downloaded uh some of the things i've i've learned from the old heads uh, on the airport uh i go and volunteer helping them with uh with inspections on on the cessnas and stuff like that like hundred hours or annuals and things like that, and the, these guys are uh, Vietnam vets. So they and, and so they've been around general aviation for a very long time, yes. and they even them, even those guys that's been on general aviation for forty years, they still go next door and ask the guy over there, like, hey, what do you think about this or what about that or, you know, yeah. they still do the research and uh, so that's it's good to know instead of just trying to do guesswork and or outdated information. So yeah, that's, it's pretty, I, I've seen it with my own eyes that uh, it's pretty, it's pretty common where if a guy doesn't know he'll call or, or um, go next door and, and ask for help. Oh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if there's something that you're not sure of, don't do it because yeah you this is a federal license and federal licenses come with federal consequences for sure and some people that either don't have a license or don't really i guess they have a nonchalance about them mm. they're something's gonna happen if it hasn't already you know and right. you don't be responsible for hurting someone and or hurting yourself so that's if if i'm not comfortable i'm not doing it yeah there, you can always pick up and get another job. You know, if you're in prison or you got laid off because something got missed, that's yeah. a little, or your license gets suspended. That's, yeah. it's hard. You can't get another license. You can always get another job. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, what would you say would be the single biggest help when you were transitioning? Ooh. Mm. Honestly, I would probably say LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Cuz I yeah, I realized 
very quickly that there was a lot I did not know. And right. I had for, I mean, I went in when I was 19, like right after my 19th birthday. Yeah. And I'd never worked a regular job really. Um, and so, especially not aviation. So I don't know. And even to this day, I'm always talking to my inspectors, picking their brains, but you know, to get to this point, I didn't even know how to write a resume. You know, I had to yeah. go, you know, up there and read all the posts and watch all the videos and get a lot of rejections, a lot of rejections for jobs right. I thought that I would be perfect for, like assembly right. jobs, like an AP, like why won't you hire me? You know? Right. <laughs> and they it's just the lack of of being able to communicate properly. So once right. once you kind of get in the habit of communicating and engaging you figure out what people want, you know, what they're mm -hmm. looking for. They want to help us. We just have to help them help us. Yeah, for sure. Um, I had a question, but I didn't want to throw up and I already forgot. Oh, man. <laughs> um, That's the word. Oh, yeah. So on LinkedIn, uh, regarding that, I've, I was asked the same thing. And I have guys here uh, planning to transition as well, even guys who got laid off. They're like, oh, I used LinkedIn and it's never worked for me. Well, okay. for me, I I knock on tons of doors. To me, I see that like trying to connect with people. I, you know, I always trying to connect as, with as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. And any specific, so when you're trying to get a job, any specific type of people you were looking for, like an HR person, or you're trying to connect with the recruiters or who are you following to uh, get that edge? Kind of all of it. I mean, LinkedIn has a powerful search tool. And for mm -hmm. my mentors and for the people that I wanted to reach out to, you can literally type in, you can look up on Google what companies are in the area and then go in there and type that in and write HR mm -hmm. and yeah. look up or recruiter. Um, and that's a whole nother topic because if you apply on a company website, and then a recruiter contacts you, they technically can't put you in. So now you're, you know, at mercy of whatever system they have in place to pick you out of all the other people that have applied. Right. So if you work for the recruiter, make sure you don't apply on the company website unless that recruiter tells you to do that, which I'm sure they wouldn't because they have a special system to get directly to the HR, you know, director, or the hiring right. manager, whoever it is. But um, one, I mean, one of the people we found each other on LinkedIn, I don't even remember how, but we did. Um, yeah. <laughs> people, I, I started just looking up directors of maintenance. You know, yeah. whether it's area or not was irrelevant to me. I was looking for directors of maintenance who had worked, you know, at least maintenance and inspection, which will be on their profile. And right. you send out a message to that person to connect with them and you, you introduce yourself and you say, I'm so and so person and I'm reaching out to you because I saw you had all this awesome experience and I, know nothing and I need help, you know, and sometimes yeah. people respond and sometimes they won't. Most of the time people are so happy to help. Um, yeah. And one of the people I actually met on LinkedIn and in real life, she was the first person I met in real life off LinkedIn, uh, Laura Scanlan. She's a director of maintenance in the Ohio area in Cincinnati. And she's been a tech, an inspector, a planner, like, all of it, a controller, a maintenance controller, like she's awesome. Yeah. Um, she works with the NBAA, um, which is, I forget, I always forget. Um, but they're National the Business Aviation Association. Yep. Yes, she is going to kill me that I forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, I can't believe she's been trying to woo me to go over to uh, business aviation, which they have beautiful jets. That's, that's a whole yeah. business commercial and GA totally different and military, all three, all four different animals. Um, and right. you've got to figure out what you want, but she was somebody that I reached out to that said, I was like, I need a mentor. Uh, you have this amazing career. Now you're a DOM. Like what's the secret? Mm -hmm. And People are so happy to help if you're willing to let them help you. And you have to right. be willing to listen with your ears because sometimes we get emotional about the things we know. And when people tell us that we don't know what we're talking about, we go on the defense and then we right. don't listen. And so that's right. 
that's another thing is I really look for directors of maintenance because they're ultimately making the hiring decisions on these people, people mm -hmm. like you and me. Right. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. It's just that I, you know, I get it often and I tell guys, Hey, get on LinkedIn network, find the recruiters, mm -hmm. find the HR people, find, you know, people uh, who work there now and uh, talk to those top officers and see if, see if uh, you can kind of build that relationship already and start as early as you, if you already know for a fact that you're getting out and you want to go say Charlotte, North Carolina, and you want to work there in that area, start connecting with people, you know, start mm -hmm. just like you said, uh, uh, find them, you know, look them on the company page and then find them on LinkedIn and kind of get to know them before you even actually reach out because it gives you a little, get that intel and you kind of know where to start with, with their, the conversation. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, it'll, I, I think it, uh, it'll help them tremendously just to gather, gather some in, intel and then and then uh, work that relationship. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, and there's tons of free information on company websites that they want mm -hmm. you to use on your resume to include yeah. the core values. They want the people that they hire to embody the things that the company stands for. And that's a lot of times when company talks about the perfect fit, right? that's really a lot of times what they're talking about. It's not just, you know, you have all the experience because you might not have all the experience, but you have the right attitude and you have the right. right. And so, you know, the other stuff they can change if you don't line up for what the company needs and what they're looking for in an individual, they're not going to hire you. And if you, if they do, you're not going to last long. Right. So that's, that's the other thing too. It just, and when you connect with these people, you're not asking for a job. Let me be very specific. You're not going to say, hey, I'm a new A&P and I need a job. Like yeah. nobody wants to help somebody that just walks them, you know, like that. So, yeah. I mean, that's definitely really be a humble. lot of magic. What's up? And so you definitely got to be humble when you looking for these jobs. Um, a lot of guys who are getting out, maybe they're a master sergeant or something like that. You know, especially if you've already been out, you were in the military for 20 years and expect to have a desk job. Uh, unless you're really good at some kind of desk job in the military, you're probably not going to get a desk job on the outside. You're going to kind of build yourself up to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's different. Yeah, definitely. It's it definitely, I haven't, I have the only extent, or right, my experience on in civilian at, Aircraft is working on little Cessnas, 150s, 172s. Um, I think 182s. I think it was one of them. And those are all piston. Well, yeah, they're all they're all, those are all piston engines. Yeah, they're all piston engines and just helping out these uh, little old heads with with their aircraft. Uh, it's a it's a nonprofit. They just take kids up and give them a little incentive flights, bring them back, and I just volunteered to help, you know learn more about about these planes because I have one in the back, and yeah, it's definitely definitely a different environment. This guy does he gets unpainted large sheets of aluminum, cuts it, forms it, and puts it on the plane. And that's they amazing. do yeah they do everything on in house, and I think that's pretty cool. And that's one thing I want to learn more is. Uh, the sheet metal part as well. I, you know, I can remove, remove and replace parts. These piston engine things are pretty, pretty simple and pretty easy. It's like working on a old school 1950s 350, you know, uh, Chevy engine. And but doing something cool like that, you know, forming, making your own panels and stuff like that. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, what was that? I said, I agree. I, I'm, that's why I'm always bugging the sheet metal guys. So I've <laughs> learned, I mean, now I metal fab, you know, and that's because I have that ability to walk over and say, Hey, what are you doing? You need some help? 
But it's yeah, that's the exciting part. Yeah, if you're like big into cars, like I am, you know, you know, it'd be cool to just bring my car in, fab up some stuff, <laughs> and put it on the car and head out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I like the civilian side of things because uh, I always, when I was in the military, they always gave me a hard time about uh, it's rare that a crew chief will do. I don't know how it is in the in the Marines or other services, but if you are a crew chief, it would be hard to get into sheet metal. They don't even want. They won't even let you check out really uh, the drill, the bits, and all that stuff compared. Mm-hmm. You know, civilian world. Uh, another thing I hated is that I really didn't know how to use a multimeter. Uh, just very basic stuff for a multimeter. But other than that, I, you know, taking out the pins out of cannon plugs or replacing, you know, electrical connectors, uh, the terminals. They didn't know how to do simple stuff like that. Just whatever I learned on the cars is what I, is what I learned. But I, I'm kind of upset that. Uh, but the military doesn't allow us to do all that kind of fun stuff. If you like to work on your hands, being, you know, getting your hands, uh, getting grease in your fingers and stuff like that. But uh, it's it's not existing in the military. They don't let you be flexible. But from what I understand, they're kind of kind of going towards that now. Where I know I have a couple of friends that ran programs up in Hill Air Force Base where F-35 maintenance people are learning just about every job specific duty so that's might be a a uh, transformation there on coochies like myself yeah. with the so with the 35s and i'm not really sure how entirely the air force ran it but with the navy um that was my last tour uh testing and integration up in eglin air force base mm-hmm. and they basically got rid of eye level maintenance intermediate stuff and they created what they called O plus. So we would have um, some some things we would be allowed to do now that we are authorized to do as an O plus maintenance center. And then there would anything past that would be depot level. So we actually were able to do a lot more. And because those crews are smaller, um, you can kind of con- cross train a little bit more. So that's probably. The fact that they took out uh, intermediate level maintenance and also that the crews were smaller is probably why they're allowing that. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. I I think it's a good thing. Yeah, um, I do. Too. There was the, I could take apart pants if I wanted to, which is something that only I would get to do if I worked in an engine shop only. Right. So. Yeah, I'm finding out more and more with these new aircraft or even engines. Uh, there's a lot of electrical stuff. So, and learning how to super shot wires and all these cables and things like that, running around, the, you know, running through the aircraft and plus the engines. It's, it's a good skill to, to have. It is, it really is. Oh. Mm-hmm. No. Well, um, I think we pretty much covered everything, right? Uh, you know, what you did, uh, your transition, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know what what the environment is during current times uh, yeah. aviation is a little is struggling a little bit because of the whole virus and it's going to take it's going to struggle a little bit once everything opens and allows for travel um i know that pino air park here up north of tucson is uh, i think over 300 aircraft in the last month or two have been parked big airliners so it's Yay. It's super packed, and uh, the guy that picked up the plane earlier today, he was saying that uh, his hours were cut back, and they gave him about three months of of free pay, but but he's gonna be he's still scared of what the industry is gonna look like after those three months, and if he's gonna be looking for a job or not. Oh yeah. I mean, based on how the market's going and and where it's intended to go, we're still going to need airplanes. But I think the day of the of the large commuter super plane is kind of over now because of all the overhead costs. I think Mm -hmm. we're going to see once it's all back up is an increase in business aviation and smaller planes where it's more fuel efficient. Um, Right. 
and I mean, obviously your shipping is going to jump. So things like FedEx and UPS, I think you're going to see them increase the amount of airplanes they need and technicians too. So right. something to consider, I don't know if it's actually what's going to happen, but to me, it just makes sense that it would happen that way. Yeah. And I, uh, diversify, I was, yeah. diversify your skills. Um, I was also, also looking at some of these, uh, commercial airliners, not the cargo airliners, but the, uh, the passenger jets carrying materials from, from overseas, bringing them into the States. They were just putting all these boxes in every seat. I thought that was kind of funny, but yeah, if, you know, they're going to have to adjust to new life afterwards yep. and until everything starts picking up and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's going to be interesting in the next, I mean, rest of this year and, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not afraid to go travel. I'm ready to go overseas. And <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, I'm ready to go. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not afraid of it, but you know, they, I'm sure there's going to be a good portion of the population hesitant to to travel. So, oh, for sure. you know, until the demand is there, uh, it's, it's going to be kind of interesting of what that's going to look like. I see everybody at the grocery store and I figure people would be scared to go into the, in the Walmarts or the, you know, these, those type of stores, but no, they're, it's whatever. I don't see everybody using a mask. Uh, to me, it's kind of, uh, kind of normal to see people in masks because I've been overseas and especially Asia a lot yeah. and people wearing masks all the time. So it doesn't bother me or scare me, but yeah, unless the demand for overseas travel is, in a pickup, uh, yeah, it's gonna be kind of slow for uh, commercial passenger airliners to pick up. Yeah, it'll be slow, but it. Well, I don't think that aviation is dead by any means. I oh think no, no. I, I, I have my predictions, and I think um, supersonic speed, supersonic travel is yeah. is really going to be where it's at. Which we're seeing more companies like that anyway. So again that's kind of a merger of aviation aerospace. So you want to diversify, you want to get your AET, you want to get your FCCs, you want to look at companies yeah. like Space Tech. I mean, that's yeah. what I'm headed for. By the end of this year, I'd, I'd like to have more qualifications, at least three more. Right, right. Yeah, the, uh, that's one thing we're working on too, the sheet metal stuff and trying mm -hmm. to, try to organize that, that certificate as well and be prepared. Because I, I think it's a good thing, even if, if if uh, you've never done sheet metal, but you know you got your AMP, but I noticed that there's a lot of AMPs that are not proficient with sheet metal, and I've, I've talked to a couple of guys and said, man, I, I do want to get into sheet metal. So hopefully we can provide that here. Uh, not a lot. So if you're a business owner, you know, or looking to have a business, I think sheet metal training is where it's at. I don't know. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm definitely jumping into it and see if uh, dabble in that. Had to had to move some stuff around, but uh, now <laughs> we made space and now I just get a couple of things. I talked to Bombardier; they're they're on board. They're I don't know if that's even how you say it, but that's Bombardier. that's how I'm gonna say it. Yeah, <laughs> Bombardier. I, I I used to call it Bombardier or something like that. I think it's Bombardier. I think you're right. The the first way you said it, I, I think you're right. Yeah. So, but I look forward to seeing all the good things that come out of there. Um, and I'll probably, I mean, you already know I signed up for your AET course. So mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate know. it. I actually, didn't, oh, no, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking through the enrollments. And I was like, I know this name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, was, yeah. Pretty much everything's automated and this online course is, is uh, kind of new. So uh, I, I forget if we have it because I have other guys kind of like dealing with it. And it's like, oh man. So there's a lot of questions and things are popping up because it's new and we're trying to, to uh, orga get ourselves organized for that. For sure. So we're working on it. All right then, I uh, appreciate it Lorraine and uh, talking about your experience of the military and then the transition. That's, that's what's, uh, that's gonna be super helpful and valuable to, to people looking to transition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm always here. You see me on LinkedIn. I took a little break. I'm back now. 
yeah um, and see what what all we can put together maybe to help some of these guys and gals yep for sure for sure and uh look forward to it yeah all right take it easy brother take it easy you too bye all right